Today we'll be discussing some complicated and controversial issues in Buddhism. That is, suicide and euthanasia. I'm Doug Smith of the Online Dharma Institute, that's onlinedharma.org. If you're new to this channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to the channel and click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications when I come out with new videos. So, suicide and euthanasia, and I'll be focusing mostly on euthanasia here because it's the more difficult case. Euthanasia it means it comes from the Greek words meaning basically a good death. It's what, uh, what happens or what we might do with somebody who is near to, de near to death and in a very difficult or bad situation uh, with a pain or other kinds of suffering. And so we may hasten death for this, for this individual, this being, because we feel that that is the way to make death better. This is a very uh, controversial and complicated issue uh, within Buddhism. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is give something of an introduction to the issue of euthanasia in, gen in specific and a little bit about uh, suicide more generally. Uh, but this is only going to be an introduction. There's going to be plenty more that could be said. I mean, I could make a video much, much longer than this. Um, but what I want to do is focus in particular on early Buddhism, on the Buddha himself and his responses. And as usual in these videos, I'll put uh, references to a lot of papers and so on that we'll be discussing as, as we go on. I'll put them down below in the show notes. Uh, what we'll see here is that there is a, a big difference between early Buddhism and later Buddhism on this subject, or at least on certain aspects of this subject. And in particular, and I think more, more specifically, there is a big difference between the Buddha's own ideas and the ideas even of some of his closest disciples on uh, one key aspect that we'll be really uh, delving into later on. But before we get to that, we should back up and look at the bigger picture. Uh, because uh, suicide in Buddhism in general, which is the bigger picture here, is considered wrong. In, uh, in all of Buddhism, the, the first precept is not to kill. And killing a human being is some of, brings upon us some of the worst karmic consequences, it's believed. And so we, we specifically want not to kill humans. But killing in general, of course, is considered wrong. And in the Vinaya, that is the, the teaching of the Buddhist rules, the Buddhist ethical rules for monastics, it's taught that uh, inciting someone to suicide is very much equivalent to killing them. So inciting someone to kill themselves is also uh, very, very wrong in the same way that murder is wrong. However, the case of one's own suicide is less clear. That is to say, there is an early passage from the Vinaya that appears or has been translated sometimes to say that committing suicide is wrong for oneself. However, uh, as other people have pointed out, if scholars have pointed out, actually this particular passage from the Vinaya doesn't say that. It's a passage that comes about because a monastic wished to kill himself, and so threw himself off of a high ledge, off of a high place, and happened to strike someone else on the way down, uh, either injuring or killing them, although this monastic survived. Um, so what the point is, is that you should not throw yourself off of a high place because you're liable to injure other people. That itself doesn't really touch on the idea of whether suicide in one's own behalf is wrong, Although it's generally believed within, within Buddhism, within Buddhist teachings, that uh, committing suicide brings upon oneself a lot of very bad karma. Perhaps the most famous example of suicide in early Buddhism involves the suicide of a large number of monks. It's said that the Buddha went to these monks uh, and gave them a teaching about the foul nature of the body, which was a standard teaching. Indeed, it's a teaching we find in the Sutta on Mindfulness. It's a sutta that's, I should say, it's a teaching that's intended to make us cease clinging to our bodies, cease feel, uh, identifying with our bodies, because we see that they also are ugly. They're not so beautiful as we might think, depending on how we look at them. But it's said in this sutta that uh, the monastics took this the wrong way. They became so uh, 
disgusted with themselves that when the Buddha left and went on long retreat, many of the, these monastics decided to commit suicide. And it's clear when the Buddha returned and heard about this that he was mortified. He was uh, horrified that, that this had happened. And the, the monastics that were left, the Buddha gave a, a talk about a mindfulness of breathing in order to basically calm them down and uh, stop them from, from thinking such horrible things. Now, clearly, nobody wants that kind of, uh, that kind of effect. Nobody wants that sort of thing to happen, uh, least of all the Buddha. Now, scholar uh, Peter Harvey has a very good introduction to Buddha, Buddhist ethics where he discusses the issue of suicide and euthanasia and talks about how, in traditional Buddhism, both suicide and euthanasia are considered wrong. Uh, now, when it comes to suicide, I think the case is, is pretty clear that suicide, in general, is considered a part of the uh, grasping for non-existence, which is the flip side of grasping for uh, eternal existence. It's, it's one of the, the traditional kinds of uh, forms of wrong view, forms of delusion that we get ourselves into. Ordinarily, we, we crave for eternal existence. We crave to continue existing. But if we are under the delusions of a depressive state of mind, we can flip completely and fall into the delusion for non-existence, this grasping for for death, for non-existence. That's what suicide is considered within, within Buddhism. And as such, it is a, it's a delusion. It's the sort of thing that we want to get ourselves out from under. When it comes to euthanasia, the case is somewhat less clear. Uh, it's said that in, in Buddhism that uh, you're obviously if you're not ever absolutely sure whether the person isn't going to recover. So they may be in a very bad state, suffering a lot, but perhaps they'll get over it and, and get better. It's also said that you don't know whether the person uh, is going to be born into a better life, the next life, or not. That perhaps allowing them to have a good unassisted death will allow them to be reborn into a better life than the reverse. So, as a result, it's generally believed in Buddhism, as Peter Harvey argues, that the best thing to do with somebody who's dying even somebody who is uh, suffering, is to give them the best life possible, to give them palliative care, to help them have a good death in that way. Now, having said that, I think it's important and incumbent upon me to say my own position here, which is that, uh, to, to me, it is simply unethical to require somebody to undergo terrible suffering uh, on in the behalf of what actually are relatively speculative religious ideals. In my opinion, uh, the problem comes in cases of extreme suffering, uh, which does happen at the end of life. And as a result, my again, my opinion is that it has to be up to the individual and the individual alone how they want to approach that. It has to be up to them. They have to have the the, the right and the ability to end their suffering if that's what they wish. And that includes having a living will, which I myself have and which other members of my family have, to be able to tell to other people how they want to end their life if they're not able to say so in person. And I am aware that these things, all any of these decisions have caveats, have upsides and downsides. Nothing is ever really perfect. But again, none of us really know for certain what happens after we die. And so all we can do is play the best we can. Um, I know from personal experience of members of my family that the ability of medical science to uh, alleviate suffering is far from perfect. Uh, it often seems to be believed by people that uh, medicine is, is very, very good at alleviating suffering, and, and it's pretty good under certain circumstances. But when things get bad, in particular in very serious kinds of illnesses, uh, medical science is not able to eliminate suffering, and so it is indeed quite possible to have a, a really agonizing period of time. And in my opinion, a life, an end of life filled with suffering is not a good death. It's not a good end of life. And it's better to have our own control over that, to do with what we wish. If we wish to undergo the suffering, then we do that.
but if we don't wish to, then we don't. But now let's turn to the Buddha's own views on this matter. And it seems that the Buddha's views conflict with some of the later teachings and conflict with the opinions of some of his disciples. But even that is something that is controversial. There's lots of controversy here. In any event, there are several examples in the early suttas of very accomplished monastics who decide to commit suicide with the apparent consent of the Buddha himself. Now, uh, Analyo, the scholar, the great scholar of early Buddhism and meditator, he's a, a monastic scholar, has papers on three of the most famous of these cases. And I'll, again, I'll put links to those papers down below in the show notes in case you want to take a look at them. Also, a contemporary Buddhist scholar, Damien Kuhn, has a paper about one of them, perhaps the most famous, which is the case of Channa, who is one of the Buddha's disciples. Uh, in this uh, example, in this sutta, uh, Channa is in, in great pain, in, in terrible suffering. And what happens is that Sariputta, who is the, the Buddha's main disciple, who is considered the, the fount of wisdom, his wisest disciple, goes to see Channa to ask how he's doing. And Channa tell, tells Sariputta that he's, he's not doing well, that he's getting worse. He describes the, the terrible pain that he's going through. And Channa says that he is going to use the knife, which is a euphemism in early Buddhism or a way of saying that he is going to commit suicide. And Sariputta is clearly uh, horrified by this. And Sariputta asks Channa, he says, do you have enough food? Do you have enough medicine? Do you have good enough care? He says, if you, if you need food, I'll bring you food. If you need medicine, I'll go find you medicine and bring it to you. If you need care, I will care for you or find someone who can. But Channa says that he has all of those things. He doesn't need them. And then he, he says to, to Sariputta, he says, for a long time now, I have served the Buddha with love. You should remember this. The monk Channa used the knife blamelessly. He used the knife blamelessly. And then Sariputta later, uh, after having cross-examined Channa and discussed things with Channa for a while, he eventually leaves, after which Channa uses the knife. When Sariputta hears of this, he goes to the Buddha and he asks the Buddha where Channa has been reborn. Because Sariputta clearly believes that Channa has done something uh, very wrong, and that therefore he is worried or concerned that Channa has been reborn into a, a bad situation, or concerned at least about what situation, into what situation he has been reborn. And so he asks the Buddha to, to answer this question. And the Buddha, in response, chides Sariputta. He says, Sariputta, didn't the mendicant Channa declare his blamelessness to you personally? That is, the Buddha says that Channa was not reborn, that he had died an awakened being. He had died an arahant. He had essentially ended his round of rebirths. This is the traditional belief that once you have become awakened, you cease the round of rebirths. And uh, Sariputta was clearly shocked by this. Uh, he had not expected that answer. And indeed, later monastics seemed not to have been uh, accepting that answer, or at least have to have been shocked by it, because of what we find in the commentaries. In the commentaries to this sutta, it's said that Channa, in fact, did not become awakened until after he had used the knife. That is to say, that when he he, that he had done something with that knife, presumably cut a vein or something like that, and then while he was dying, he became awakened, but that he hadn't been awakened before that. Now the question is, why does the, why do the commentaries say this? What is the importance about making this kind of nuanced reinterpretation of the sutta? Well, the answer is that uh, arahants, awakened beings, are not are supposedly not able to do anything unethical. Indeed, the Buddha says this on a number of occasions. They're not capable of violating the precepts. And of course, the first precept is not to kill. And indeed, for the same reason, Damien Kuhn, this a contemporary scholar, uh, agrees with the commentary that indeed, if you look at the commentarial description, he says, 
uh, you can see that, that uh, a Channa must have become awakened after using the knife. And also what uh, Damien Kuhn says is that on his reading of the sutta, the Buddha doesn't, he's, well, he makes a distinction between condoning and exonerating. What Kuhn says is that uh, the Buddha doesn't condone Channa's actions, but he exonerates Channa. And here, Kuhn is using a, an explicitly Christian notion of removing guilt. So what Kuhn says is that, the, is that the Buddha doesn't agree with what Channa did, but he exonerates Channa by removing Channa's guilt in what he says. Now, to my way of thinking, uh, this uh, move is, comes out of Christianity and doesn't fit the early Buddhist context, because in early Buddhism, the, the, the Buddha simply doesn't have the, the power to exonerate anybody in, in a Christian sense. Uh, so that, that move doesn't, to me, make sense. Uh, nevertheless, that is one potential uh, reading here. As I say, Kuhn also agrees with the commentary that, that uh, Chana did not become awakened until after using the knife. However, uh, this, in Analyo's understanding is quite contrived. And indeed, both Analyu and the eminent scholar and translator Bhikkhu Bodhi uh, disagree with Kuhn here. Both of them believe that it's quite clear from the sutta that Channa was awakened before Sariputta had even arrived. Indeed, how else would Channa have known that he would use the knife blamelessly? Uh, that's the whole point of the sutta. As Bhikkhu Bodhi writes, it should be noted that this commentarial interpretation is imposed on the text from the outside, as it were. If one sticks to the actual wording of the text, it seems that Channa was already an arahant, that is, an awakened person, when he made his declaration, the dramatic punch being delivered by the failure of his two brother monks to recognize this. That is, a Sariputta, and there was a second monk at the time as well who also failed to recognize it. And as Bhikkhu Bodhi points out here, the implication is that an awakened person can indeed take their own lives under certain circumstances. And Analyo as well, having looked at uh, these three uh, examples, three of the examples in the early text, there actually are others, but three particularly important examples in the early text of monastics committing suicide, uh, in, in those examples, uh, uh, Analyo looks at those texts and compares them to other recensions, other texts in other languages that are also early from the Chinese and other uh, Indic languages to see what these early texts show. And Analyo also agrees with Bhikkhu Bodhi that that is the upshot, that it, given the information we have to us today, it appears that the Buddha is indeed condoning these actions. I would say more than simply trying to exonerate somebody, he's saying that there's nothing wrong with them. So what is the problem here then? The problem, as I've said, is the first precept itself, not to kill. Now, there are a number of potential responses we can give that Analyo goes through some of here. Uh, one of the responses that I would also give is that uh, we know already from uh, descriptions of the awakened state in the early texts that the Buddha himself enjoyed spending time in jhana, that is to say, in states, in, in pleasant states of meditative absorption, which he called uh, pleasant states of abiding. So that is to say that the Buddha didn't seek out unpleasantness or uh, uh, painfulness just for its own sake. Uh, he didn't seek out uh, uh, noisy environments just for their own sake, he tried to remain quiet. He tried to remain in pleasant states, even though he was awakened and as a result didn't have any particular clinging to them. Indeed, an awakened person no longer clings to existence in general. So why would we expect them to want to uh, continue a life that is extremely unpleasant? There's no immediate reason for it. Secondly, uh, as regards killing itself, uh, Analyo points out a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, perhaps the most assiduous practitioners of ahimsa, or non-harming, uh, 
in ancient India were the Jains. Indeed, some people believe that a certain amount of what the Buddha had to say about non-harming came from Jains originally. The Jains, as we may know, uh, tried to kill nothing. They would go around with cloth, cloth masks over their mouths so that they wouldn't breathe in creatures from the, from the air. They would sweep the, the ground in front of them so as not to step on small creatures unintentionally. Yet within Jainism, there was the, uh, the belief that one of the highest sorts of aims one could uh, get for oneself was to starve oneself to death. That was the sort of the height of non-harming, because in starving oneself to death, one is deciding not to harm anything. Now, it has to be emphasized that, ha that this kind of self-starvation has to be done under very particular circumstances. It can't just be done at any time by anybody. This is a very specific ritual kind of thing to do, and in general, Jainism is against suicide. However, we have to see that under certain particular extenuating circumstances, suicide was, was thought of as the sort of height of non-harming within Jainism. The second point that Analyo makes is that at the end of the Buddha's life, in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, which describes that end period of the Buddha's life, there's a very real sense in which the Buddha decides to end his life with a deliberate decision. Here the Buddha is uh, is having a discussion with Mara, Mara the tempter, who was trying to get the Buddha to end his life. And eventually the Buddha says that he has decided that in three months' time he is going to die. Indeed, after having said that, it's said, at the Chapala tree shrine, the Buddha, mindful and aware, surrendered the life force. And this description seems to back up this idea that the Buddha had or may have had, that the awakened person could indeed rightly decide to end their own lives if they felt that their task was done. And indeed the Buddha himself says that he has made this decision because his task is done. His task was to set up the Dharma, to set up the Sangha, to propagate this Dharma and Sangha around the world or around his area so that it would continue. And once that was done and done properly, his work was done, and then he could uh, renounce this life force. And so it seems that uh, at least it, there is a, 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 an expression called uh, Lectio Difficilior, which describes the way that we interpret old texts. We look at old texts that seem to have particularly difficult interpretations, and those, or at least interpretations that, that grated against uh, the beliefs of others at their time. And the, the general belief in, in, in textual interpretation, in, in fact this originated in a biblical interpretation, is that these interpretations that go against the beliefs of others of their time were probably more likely to be true, to be original to the, to the speaker, uh, if they persist. Because there's this difference of opinion and there's no attempt to level them and, and to agree on opinions. They're difficult opinions. And this, so this view of the Buddhas that, that awakened beings could decide to end their own lives correctly and properly if they felt that their time had come to an end, that they could no longer be useful in the world, that seems to have been a difficult decision, one that was not shared by others at his time. Indeed, it's clear from the text, the, Chan, the text about Channa that I talked about that it even shocked Sariputta himself, who did not believe that Channa uh, had died an, uh, an awakened being. It's this kind of, uh, of shock which persists into the commentarial tradition, where we have commentators trying to rewrite or uh, re-understand the sutta in different ways so as to make it uh, seem to be more consistent with other teachings at the time. Although, in my own opinion, this is an example of of clinging to rules and rituals. There's another ta there's another aspect of early Buddhist teaching where we should be uh, we should be concerned if we're clinging to simple forms and rules and rituals rather than looking deeper at the at the at the broader context and the underlying important points. Which, in this context, to me has to do with compassion. 
Still, it does reflect very well on the tradition here that there wasn't a leveling of commentaries and suttas. That is, that we still retain the information in the suttas that shows the commentaries to be, at least in my opinion, faulty in this, in this circumstance. This lack of leveling shows that at least in, in, in certain circumstances, there has been at least potentially an effective transmission of the, su the sutra material to the present day. Now, but the, base, the, the important point here is one of compassion, of retaining compassion for people who are undergoing great suffering. Although this, these particular cases speak of the narrow issue about arahants, about awakened beings, I think we can take a, a broader, at least somewhat broader kind of later interpretation down to the present day where we say that it's not entirely clear that euthanasia is wrong in all cases. Again, in my own personal opinion, it's not necessarily wrong. It depends upon the case. But uh, we have seen other cases as well in which the, the idea of compassion has changed within Buddhist history, where compassion, the idea, an earlier idea of compassion, has turned in ways that make it something quite different. I did an earlier video on that specific subject, how compassion became empathy, looking at a paper, another paper by uh, Bhikkhu Analyo. And I'll put a link to that up on the screen. I would recommend taking a look at it if you want to see further issues of the history of Buddhist compassion. Thanks so much to my patrons over on Patreon. If you're getting something out of these videos, uh, consider joining them. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you on the next video. Meanwhile, all of you be well.